The motion for this house is this house of the BJP would have India join the RCEP. What are we because they know that it's advantageous to do so and you've had such significant ties with these types of countries for so long that even if you do reduce it, the marginal is so the margins are so small. This is why the US and China are still the certain largest partners between each other. Two, the majority of the partners are relatively good and economically strong. This is really, really important because that tells you that the Asia Pacific region is very, very powerful in terms of economic growth and is becoming a hub of regional economic growth. The reason why Singapore is becoming very important is also for the same reasons. Thirdly, this is going to be one of the many partnerships that India has. This is important because we are going to say that India can still work with the US and is probably going to do so. India has one of the cheapest amounts of goods that you can export and the US really likes cheap goods, so they are going to do this. This is why the US is okay with India also kind of working with Russia and doing those types of oil types of trades because they understand that there needs to be multiple types of partnerships. I think they are relatively comfortable with these kinds of things. Fourthly, the most important thing to notice about the context of now is that it's getting significantly more regionalized. This is important because that means that now there is incentive for countries to work closer within each other. The reason why China is willing to work most with Asia and fix the diplomatic relations it has within those regions is because it understands that the regionalization is important. This is also why you see the US trying to work more with Latin America and work more with Canada because they understand the types of regionalization and that people are willing to do these kinds of things. Fifth, there is a, India is at a very unique point at its stage. It is transitioning to a middle income economy. The reason why this is important is because it needs to shift then from manufacturing assembly, which is low cost, to export oriented growth. The reason why this is really important is that they need to start finding new trade partners and start improving the types of relationships that they have. So right now, India is growing, yes, but they are growing at the term of manufacturing and that growth is going to significantly decline. So they need to diversify the numbers of people they are trading with in order to establish significantly good relations. But sixth, I want to flag, we don't have to defend the morality of the BJP. This is not a debate about the BJP, good or bad. I really don't like them, but I think I'm going to talk about why it's good for the India as a whole for them. Seventhly, seventh. Important. The US has spread itself really thin. It gives the most amount of loans, but it's also kind of fucking up in terms of their diplomatic relations. This is very important, especially with the Israel and Palestine thing. The most global south is not necessarily in good favor with the US, and they're probably not the best people to work with right now. And I think India recognizes that and wants to ensure that it has other relations in case people fuck over the US. Cool. Let's talk about the incentives of the BJP. I think it's threefold. One, it's about re election time. And the reason why this is really important is that India still has relatively large levels of poverty and is need, in need of fixing that. This is why you are having people asking the BJP to do these kinds of things and shift their messaging to economic growth. The reason why this is really important then is that they, to improve economic growth, they need to start to pivot the narrative that they are selling themselves as. Why is this true? Because the narrative that the BJP right now has is the Hindutva agenda. The reason why this kind of sucks is because the Hindutva agenda is not appealing when people are poor and broke and they are no longer getting actual good economic outcomes. The reason why this is important then is because the, the likelihood of them getting re-elected is at a point at which you, they are uncertain. This is important because this then shows you that there is incentive for them to change the ways in which they are selling themselves. Because where Hindutva agenda works is in a very small number of states across India. It probably works in Gujarat, but it doesn't work in places like Uttuk that are becoming the hubs of growth and where the most numbers of people who are in poverty that make up the largest chunk of the Indian population kind of live. But thirdly, this works very well with the initial selling plan that Modi set. 
which is that he wants to make India the largest economic hub by 2030 or 2050. The reason why this is important is that this perfectly aligns with his selling ability and marketing ability to people when he's telling people that he's going to start shifting the way he prioritizes what he wants to like, achieve for his country. Why should, the, why should the BJP work more with the Asia Pacific? I think this is for a few reasons. One, because the economic issues that these countries face are relatively the same with India. This means that Vietnam is also looking to diversify. It also has issues that are relatively similar in terms of how do you give more employment. Meaning that the types of relationships and policies that you work strategically align significantly more than they would with somebody in the West that has significantly different types of problems that they want to address. But two, the political characteristics of India and the Asia Pacific are relatively the same. This is very important because now India doesn't deal with the US shoving democracy down their throat and telling them that they need to do all these kinds of things if they want to work more with them. You're more likely to get countries in East Asia being significantly more chill with BJP probably being a little more autocratic than somebody in the US because they really they don't necessarily care. Right? It's all about trade and economic growth for Singapore and for Vietnam. They don't prioritize conditionality when it comes to these types of agreements. But thirdly, the conditions to work with the Asia Pacific just geographically are just so much easier. There are already significantly good infrastructure that exists within these types of countries and the rest of South Asia also have great relationships with the Asia Pacific. It just is an extension. Before I move on, closing. No engagement. Cool. Opening. Also no engagement. That's a problem. Cool. Yeah. Okay. It's unclear whether the BJP actually needs economic growth. Can't they just scapegoat bad people and say um, they're responsible for the bad economy? Um, no, because like India is still in poverty. There's still a lower middle income economy. They also have incentive to grow for what you listen to my entire speech. That tells you everything. Why will this bring balance to the RCEP? I think for a few reasons why China is not probably going to be the most important thing. One, China is dying economically, they are backsliding, they are suffering from inflation, they are having a housing crisis too. It's political unrest. People are not necessarily very happy in China right now. This is why it's difficult for Xi Jinping to get significant amounts of popularity. But two, China also wants to work with India. India is the third largest economy within this type of region. There is incentive to do this and India has labor pools that work very well with China who is suffering from a labor shortage. But three, don't underestimate the rest of the countries that exist within these things that can balance out even if China is a bit of a wishy-washy character for India to work with. These are powerful countries with powerful economies. But why will India have the most amount of power that is good for them? Because they are still one of the largest economies in the world and they have the most amount of bargaining power and what is the one who does the most amount of work in terms of building diplomatic relationships. This is a strategically smart move for the BJP to make for election but also to make India great. So proud to make propose. We'd like to speak over those other remarks and we'd like to call on the leader of the opposition. Very good.
biggest thing that they've created it's a case study in UN that teaches you that there's like they created a digitization where they record like data of healthcare which significantly also figures out or improves healthcare this is important because Modi has also vouched to sell this digital to the vast majority of Asia and that's how they want to benefit and pocket in a lot of profits they are running on this campaign people believe in it secondary I think this free trade is important because in terms of economic crisis you might not have a whole economic crisis fall but market in industry fall this is important because in the market like wheat or other smaller markets where they don't specialize Singapore Laos and all of these other small countries do they'll get concession for cheap wheat which means unskilled labor can finally be pushed to upper skill level like labor which Sandeep tells you they're trying to be middle class and more earning third degree infrastructure one belt and road initiative has created sea routes ports and infrastructure India can leverage the pre-existing infrastructure to use the free trade agreement and make it more easy I think it's not expensive to trade things when China has already done the thing for you I think China won't obstruct you simply because they're so busy trying to make sure they don't have deflation and people and unemployment that they literally stop publishing their unemployment rates China is incredibly vulnerable I think it's good third degree I think the reason why this free trade is great is because these are economies in South Asia they have similar characteristics economic inequality certain things like the way poverty rates are which essentially means cross-border characterization similarity essentially allows for better and good policies to be made that means policies are targeted wash any of these things that they say because they're probably coalitionally trying to solve particular problems if Singapore which do uh, like specialize in, in like electrical stuff they'll give it to India before I move on open it and close it bad engagement opening India probably does not want to free trade all economies in the RCB because some countries have competitive advantages over them I mean that's exactly why you export through the free trade which also shows that you don't have to pay taxes for the thing that you import and that you get for cheaper that it goes both ways literally and as a result you can export what you specialize in which is outsourcing and IT for a much cheaper place that's why we have trade to begin with we don't want all country to specialize in every possible thing because that's a physically possible or literally see resource wise possible or human capital wise possible we want to trade things that you do best you give it to me and I do best and I give this is the best way to go by because also the sheer number and the kind of capacity of these countries. If you think about Singapore, think about the digitalization and the allowance of like greater research. When you think about Laos and the smaller countries, they are willing to give you wheat because they are vulnerable and can't trade all of these basic things across borders to the West because EU does it for US. So it essentially means they are going to make concessions and give you wheat or give you simpler things. At the end of the day, I think I have already told you that violation of like, of like what at the end of the day, it aligns the most with BGP's campaign because it's falters. The best way to go about it next is talking about economic growth because this is a blanket flies to all kinds of people regardless of where you come from. I think India will benefit the most.
opening government to a large extent and opening opposition to a slightly lesser extent correctly identify that this debate is about what voters vote for. But most of their argumentation is incredibly generic, only appealing to questions of economic progress. We are going to be the first side in this debate to tell you exactly what Indian people vote on. We don't think that they necessarily vote on an increase in income. That's very hard to tell and we'll give you a couple of structural reasons why exactly. Rather, we think that they vote on rhetoric. What Modi can shout on the campaign trail, statistics and, and key identifying things he can point out. Right? And there are two types of rhetoric that I'm going to talk about in my extension matter. But firstly, why is it that we don't think that when the GDP rises, suddenly Modi gets re-elected? Firstly, because it, it takes a massive amount of time for companies to notice India is cheaper and change as a supplier, for instance. So it takes a massive amount of time for economic progress to accrue. So even if it's the first election, we think BJP loses the, the, the first election if it's just their mechanism alone. Secondly, it takes time to build factories and adapt to the, the new types of demand that you're appealing to in the region. Thirdly, there, there is a massive time lag between the policy implementation and income increases, right? For you to like get a new job to be hired, for you to be like given a promotion or a raise, all of that takes time. And I think lastly and most importantly, opening up government assumes that the poor people will naturally get an income raise and never prove why. But I think generally we see that income raises don't go to the poor people and rich people accrue most of the benefit. So I don't think they, they appeal to the massive voter population that they're trying to. With opening opposition, again, they actually have a, a very contentious mechanism to the vote as well because they say that there will be an influx of cheaper products for Indians, which sounds like a good thing for Indians. And then they say there is a loss of factory jobs. Again, it's unclear why Indian voters will directly link that to Modi's policies and who is, is, is and, and exactly why voters will think this is a, a problem. We're going to give you actual mechanisms on firstly defensive and offensive rhetoric. But before that, I'm going to do very quickly with opening opposition. The main arguments are that jobs are being lost. Um, the policy solution is that you can have many individual alliances. Opening government doesn't really deal with this, this problem and tell you why it's not good. We're going to tell you why. It's because it takes many years to individually negotiate with each country. And if you have to do that for 30 countries in, in a trade deal, that's going to take decades. And on top of that, each country, they assert that you will just get a magically good trade deal. That's not true. Each country has specific economic requirements. And that means that they will take a lot more time to negotiate and might get you a worse trade deal. And also, I think it's very principally inconsistent whether to try to co-op all of government's benefits by saying they're going to have many trade deals, but at the same time, try to say that trade deals are bad and you don't like free trade. It's a very disingenuous policy. Um, lastly, they, they, they have one other argument that because the, the, this pact is created by China, um, it's, it's bad. They de never tell you what China is doing in, in, in this like trade forum and why, what kind of policy is instituted. We're going to deal with China directly in our extension, but also um, it doesn't matter if you can prove that India benefits. With that, two, two main reasons why we think that Modi has better rhetoric on our side. Firstly, he has better defensive rhetoric. The greatest threat to Modi, Modi getting re-elected has been the fact that he has Cr criminally neglected the farmers and the low-wage workers who have been rioting on the streets in India. And this has hurt his, his campaign for two reasons. Firstly, because it makes him seem weak and lacks stability. He is a strong man, kind of almost autocratic type uh, figure who prides himself on stability and the fact that there are riots on the streets every day make him seem incredibly weak. And secondly, it makes him seem incredibly callous. They want to talk about Hindutva. Hindutva applies to these kinds of farmers who seem who are, are like treated as the bedrock of Indian society, who are seen as like the people who are who every populist leader should be appealing to. Why do we think that our policy helps? Because it actually helps improve rice exports and reduce the, the farmers' riots, right? We, this is a huge voting block that allows us to actually uh, uh, solve the problem because although there's, there's an export ban on certain types of rice, now there's a massive increase in demand because we appeal to people in this free trade block. And Asians love rice, we know this. Secondly, it is crucially also percep perceptually allows them to remain consistent because Modi doesn't want to go back on his stance on this export ban because he's a strong man. His like, entire appeal is about remaining principled consistent. So we get we get that too and we get a very sweet deal here by allowing him to, to allay farmers' concerns while seeming principally consistent. I think this deals with a lot of the mechanisms. I'll take that here right, right now. Yeah, with this policy, Congress can point to a lot of agricultural jobs in Vietnam and Laos after joining the so, RCP to attack BJP. I, I, I don't think this will happen. And this, this second part of an offensive rhetoric rather than defensive rhetoric will tell you not only why we like appeal to anti-China voters that they are talking about, but anti-anybody else voters and we think that India actually will benefit from this trade deal. So a couple of reasons why we think India will benefit more from this trade deal than China, and then Modi will be able to use that on the campaign trip, right? Firstly, because China has had an increasing cost of labor compared to India as it's developed. Its GDP per capita and income has risen dramatically compared to India, 
and that means that labor costs have risen because of the development that's happened first in China. Secondly, China has a failing economy. It has lagging consumer demand. It has a, a like property crash that is imminent because of massive amounts of debt. Um, and and, and thirdly, India's economy is far more international than China's because it has a lot more English speakers, unfortunately due to colonialism, but it still means that they have a far better uh, international appeal. All of this means that Modi can now show statistics that, look, we, have show, we are gaining more from this trade deal in, in terms of exports than China. He shows on the cam campaign trail, look at how much of our exports have grown, look at how much China, China's exports are lagging. Secondly, they will also win directly on China, in, in India China comparative, right? Because they will actually create larger trade surpluses with China. Why? Because we think China will import more from India than vice versa, which will lead to massive trade deficits that uh, trade surpluses that, in, that India and Modi can say, look, we are winning the, the same way Trump did with India and Mexico. Why? Because China is a larger economy and GDP per capita, and then it's likely to import more. Secondly, China and other countries in the region, like Vietnam, like Bangladesh, or whoever they want to talk about, have massive demands for Indian goods, like rice, which is which they have a massive demand, um, massive like control over the market of silk and so on. Thirdly, again, Indian goods are cheaper because of their lower labor costs. Now, dealing directly again with this, this POI that we heard, right? They tell you that some countries have competitive advantage over India. And the only reason for this is that other countries have a head start. Excuse me, why? India was a, a, a country for a, a very long time that was developing for a very long time. They also give you no structural reasons why labor costs are lower, why they, they are not a good economy. I have given you structural reasons right now about why India actually has a good economy, has an international economy, it has low labor costs, and is very willing to invest in, in this space. But on, on top of that, we, we think that like, they, they have no link to why voters can tell that this is ha happening in the first place. Voters might not be able to tell that there is a comparative advantage in the first place. And that is the, the key contribution in our extension. That we are telling you exactly what voters will see as a result of the policy, which is what Modi tells the people about the policy. It is not about any of the economic links that they, they, they claim. The, you can't tell that your factory job was lost or not because of this policy. You can tell what Modi tells you. You will buy what Modi tells you because you are a Hindu, Hindu nationalist to the day you die. So very proud to stand outside the government. We thank the chair for all the remarks. We would like to remind the team that the team should be quieter and would like to welcome the members of the team. fill in a few gaps from O. First, I'm going to explain why other countries will take deals that they describe, that GUP describes as unfavorable. Second, I'm going to explain, explain why India's market necessarily can't compete internationally it's, it, when you do engage with the RCEP. Then I'm going to explain why China often does matter more than the policy and the economic benefit that GUP wants to talk about and do the crucial way that, uh, uh, that, GUP, that O misses. And then lastly, I'm going to explain the self-interest of the party and why they specifically will matter more to the party than whatever sort of like economic benefit. Okay, first, OG says trade is good, and OO just says that you can have unilateral sort of free trade deals, uh, but when it's good for the BJP, right? What they do miss is that why other countries want to engage with the single biggest um, sort of consumer, right? And this is specifically, and th this is our main sort of mechanism too, right? Why do other countries want access to India's like consumer market? One, because it is literally for the the biggest consumer market in the world. Two, because India's goods are cheaper, which is because they're, they have the biggest sort of domestic labor market that can produce the cheapest sort of goods. Three, because of the types of investment that are flowing here, i.e. this investment growth that you see in India is a lot more stable compared to a lot of other countries, even ones like America, that see significantly more ups and downs trajectories. India is one that is much more stable because of the geopolitical region that it's in, insofar as it is a political sort of like, um, 
like a, a, it is politically used as a sort of like an anti-China sort of um, investment, and that means that it continually grows over time. A lot of in, in these cases, you see a lot of that stability over time, right? But CG then says, well, you have unique needs and unilateral one-to-one -one agreements, and they're probably going to be slow. I think this just fails to a gut check. Insofar as RCEP probably requires everyone to get on board in order to get reach any form of agreement, insofar as Chinese leverage within everyone getting on board is probably one that's specifically bad for you. I think it's unclear to me why India can't specifically use their big dog power and like in, in, in a unilateral agreement to a greater extent probably it, it take you into a deal that is necessarily unfavorable to another country. I think India being one of the biggest sort of markets is probably a good reason for this, right? But second, here's why India's market isn't necessarily good enough to compete internationally. One, I think they just haven't necessarily met like key startup costs in like specific industries, i.e. They, they suffer from things like lack of sanitation, a lot of industries, lack of electri electrification, to scale, right? And this is where this is where like Korea's sort of example of Samsung becoming a protectionist industry and then and then introducing that to a widespread market is one that is usually is specifically beneficial, right? Adopting these key protectionist measures is what allows like Tata to grow as like an EV like competitor to act to Chinese ones, right? And O says like countries often the other countries countries often have a head start of India. Here's specifically why this is a crucial gap that, oh, that we need to fill in into OO to explain why the Indian market isn't necessarily good enough to compete internationally if you were to join this agreement now. First, India was later to industrialize just given post-colonialist uh, like narratives o over time, and I think that this is, spe is specifically, it, it, they have had to have significantly like later growth at, 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 like on a time scale. Second, I think there's just a lot of times bad economic policy compared to like a lot of the other sort of like key, uh, key leaders here, right? What ones like, like major Japan, like 1978, sort of like China, right? And the bad sort of economic policies oftentimes related to things like agrarian sort of farming like benefits, often like collectivist sort of like re reintroducing farming on like a, a, a normal scale and manufacturing, and that became the growth of like the agriculture industry became like the, the boom of like the manufacturing industry. And a lot of times India hasn't necessarily had the same sort of growth in a lot of these industries, which is specifically why it hasn't reached, uh, it, it, has, it hasn't reached like the point where it's good enough to compete internationally, and it's right before an inflection point where you do need to scale it up. Okay. Second, why then is the messaging of the Congress, specific, the Congress party specifically, going to be really, really bad about this? And why do Indians probably prioritize the anti-China sentiments over whatever economic harm, uh, whatever that might be? First, you as the BJP have been saying China, fuck China for years right now, right? And I think there's a historical nature of this conflict that, that, we, that OO doesn't necessarily tap into. The reason that there is such a big hatred for China is because it is one that is ideological in nature. It is one that has had a, seen a historical lack of alliance where ethnically your demographic is specifically competing with Chinese interests, right? This is why when you had like the Sino in, like, uh, Indian border conflict of 1962, you've created generational hatred of like specifically uh, of Chinese uh, like uh, uh, groups, right? And this is specifically also why you have wars that are fought with like sticks and stones between like Indians and Chinese people over the fucking border, like to this day. Um and this is specifically why they're willing to like bet out Chinese interests, even the perception of Chinese le le legitimacy within Indian sort of like uh, politics, specifically in the BJP, is, is so so bad, right? But here's the second thing, right? The way in which, specifically in the context of the North, the key region for the BJP, this is the tipping point for like a lot of the election, and this is specifically how the media is going to weaponize this, right? CG wants to say that this is about farmers, and here's why this is completely ludicrous. Punjabi farmers will never fucking go be pro BJP, and the reason is they deny the existence of the Indian state as like a legitimate entity at all. It's unclear to me why the agricultural sort of benefits that you get on their side of the house are going to be the tipping point for like these people ever joining any sort of BJP sentiment. This is never going to, you're never going to get the farming protesters on your side. But rather, I think the people that we do get on our side is people who actively do probably follow some degree of like national sort of sentiment in pro sort of Indian uh, politics. People who probably pay attention to like media sort of narratives, right? And I think what they lose out then, it's crucially on their side of the house, is it is the way in which this is probably going to be uh, covered properly, right? And here's what, how the extent of this coverage actually looks like, right? You are going to be claimed of be, literally being corrupt as a party, of having CCP sympathizers as in your uh, like party, right? And what happens when you don't engage with China is you have a huge ability to be able to continue these things. Opening, do you have a feel? Recently, China and India literally did all-time high trade. If the tensions are so bad, why aren't people already revolving? Because there's a Congress incentive to take this uh, to take this narrative and take this economic deal and portray it in a way that is unfavorable to the BJP. Even uh, uh, time and time again, they will agree to not have conflict and say, ah, oh, it's a time of peace, and people will still go to the border and fight each other. That is not a, an indicative of any revealed preference. Okay, second thing then in terms of uh, 
Yeah, oh yeah, the second thing here is the, the visibility of the econ benefits, right? I think diffuse changes are not necessarily noticed by everyday people, and this is something that is kind of, that kind of comes up out of CG. But there's, but the reason why this is bad for them is because there's no stories on why grain exports have gone down, and why this is beneficial for like agricultural developers, maybe. But there are stories on your EV factory being shut down because of Chinese dumping and trade advantages over you. There are stories of and these stories in the way that they're likely to be covered are ones on security and the localization of economic targets. Last thing then in terms of like BJP personal interests, they have a lot of personal wealth within this arm within this party. Personal interests are the interests of the BJP. The party members have their hands in the industries that are outcompeted. Why is this true? Because in status quo, there's a real preference, and this is also why they have trade, like, this is also why they have tariffs on industries in the first place, because they're in bed with a lot of the key industries that are going to be outcompeted, that they're going to lose money from, right? Even if this is better economically, the problem is that the individual politicians and, like, key sort of groups of power within the BJP are ones that are enriched and maintain their wealth within these industries that are going, that are probably not going to benefit from trade, and this is probably <laughs> reaching a point where you'll have outright the other internal who are just active politicians who, within your party who oppose this to the point at which they are actively losing their reputation by being outcompeted. They want their hands in this industry and they need the, the, these industries to always be good. Any sort of media backlash on this is bad for the interests of the individual politicians which matter more than whatever interests they're talking about. Proud to. and I want to be very clear with you, panel, on how, what their analysis looks like to you on your ballot. Because they give you a lot of analysis and reasons as to why other countries want to engage with India's market and why they're specifically appealing to try and, quote, fill a gap in over. Then the second half of the member speech knifes all of the analysis from the first argument when they argue India is the shittiest partner ever. The second they enter an international market, it's fuck all for them, and China wins, Hindutvas are like going crazy. We don't think that even if this analysis is credible, they can coexist, and we think if you have to intervene, because there's no way they're weighing this argument, right? Either way you pick, you're going to lose for the reasons that we're going to tell you now. The first, on this gut check on CG, that RACP is probably bad because you need a lot of capital to get everyone on board with something. We want to reframe by bringing to you the info slide, which told you that this isn't about like legislating, creating new free trade agreements, and that's why the partnership exists, like other things like NAFTA. This is a common law that has already been set. They're not super strict laws, it's just like a common great rules. Maybe don't fuck over your partner, maybe be nice and things like that. But why is this specifically important? Because we actually think RACP is the precondition to get you the impacts that they want to talk to you about, about the individual relationships. Because what Singapore is going to see when you're kind of getting around RACP and negotiate with them is, ah, I feel a little bit more unsafe in this diplomatic relationship you're trying to build with me because you're not in that other agreement that already says that we're insulated from tariffs and things like that. We actually think you get an increase in political capital to make such individual agreements if you buy that they're more important on their side of the house when you join RACP in the first place. That's why we access trust on engagement because other countries are going to trust you more. They're signaled that you're already willing to work with them. That is the precondition. You don't have to spend time proving that because you already have it. It's like an intuitive argument without all the mechanisms in debate in the first place. Then they tell you the Indian market can't compete internationally and protectionism. A couple of things on protectionism. One, this is just not an argument for the BJP, right? Because we think in either world, the BJP is going to go for something that isn't protectionist because they're already trying to diversify for all the reasons that OG and OO gave you in the first place. They have to prove that the counterfactual is going to be the BJP doing some protectionist policy. We don't think it's happening. This is the argument that they should specifically do RECP 
in the first place. And it's also just not compatible with Modi. We think you lose him the first of orders at the point at which you entirely shift the way you want to actually work with the economy and say, ah, actually it is going to be a protectionist economy when Modi has been shouting to his industrial supporters for literally a decade that we want world domination and we want to be the best economy in the world. You can't do that with protectionism on our side of the house. Um, this is something that we credit to OG, but importantly, that the RCP involves some countries that have similar concerns to India, like Vietnam. You're likely to cater to India's needs. We think we supercharge this with the political capital and um, individual negotiation argument. That's why we think we take out closing mob at this point. Because note that the way that they're going to try to do here is get you to pick one or the other. But the point is that their case exists in tension, right? When you pick one, you lose a lot of their delta. When you pick the other, you lose a lot of their delta. Their impact is quite, quite marginal. But we also think some of their impact is derivative from OO, which is why I'm going to move to OO now. Well, we get a very good push from opening opposition, I think, on the tipping point of voting, both for the current BJP buzz and the prospective new voters who want to draw in. First, on poorer voters. OO's only mechanism to this is the fear of losing your job because of RECP. A couple of responses. Three. One, is it like true that people lose their jobs and are already so poor that what is the bright line? Like you're losing your job compared to earning literally nothing, you're that poor in the first place. We don't think these are the voters of the Hindutva that your BGP is actually losing. Secondly, it's unclear why this is true in terms of information about RECP, ramifications, traveling back to citizens. Will this fear be strong enough? Also, are these people the currently voter for base we we have even think role that has to you? Why you're not going to implicitly directly link the RACP new free trade thing when you're a really, really poor person. Why the fuck do you give a fuck about the RCP free trade unless Modi shouts you something on the thing and directly links it to you? This is the mechanism that our opening government misses. Because they tell you that the poor people don't like him, but they don't like this, they will now vote. They don't tell you why they are drawn in. Because we think Modi is going to capitalize on this as a countervailing narrative, right? They're going to reach these groups and say, look, you are losing your job, you are so poor, you may not like Hindutva, but look at what we're doing through this really good foreign policy thing that these people are likely not paying attention to because their lives are already bad. We think Modi is likely to shout this down the line, and that's how the trickle-down effect actually happens to uh, get any OG in the past. Then then secondly, an observation of OO, because note that their model is quite like knifing itself as well. We think the op bench is really trying to squirrel here because they tell you about all of these really, really bad things about like why trade deals are like, probably bad, anti-China, all of these things. We think individual trade, trade deals on their own don't maintain their delta. They cannot co-opt the government and all say that trade is bad. We think Rohan already takes out of this. But we think we also do the same thing. We co-opt individual trade deals by capitalizing off of the political capital you get when you join RECP in the first place. Cool. Something I want to address, uh, I'll take a few actually. Yeah, what is probably going to say the economy is good on either side, <coughs> but Congress can weaponize the fear of people losing jobs in the RCP. Okay. Here's the difference that OG has given to you, preempted actually, I think, the PM, about Congress and the BJP and the relationship to one another. Because it's obvious that Congress is in opposition to the BJP. The question is how successful they are in doing it. Because the BJP, for over a decade, has been capitalizing upon, shouting to their Hindutva supporters, X, Y, Z, to the point at which Congress is actually like an illegitimate form of government for a lot of Hindutva supporters in India in the first place. This was already preempted. I don't even have to beat it. But let's talk about OG and why we differentiate. We think OG tells you generically free trade is good and that economy improves, but then tell you what voters actually care about. We tell you about the farming issue, about trade transitioning, movies, strong man image, and how how anti-China voters will respond. I want to spend a little bit of time on anti-China and why this anti-China argument coming out of pop is a big bit incoherent. Because I think this idea that ah, seeing that you join a trade deal that China is in is probably really bad because Hindus hate China, and they try to say that they fill in a gap by telling you that there's generational hatred. One, I don't think this is a filling gap because the premise of the OO argument is just that if you hate China, you're likely going to hate this policy. We don't think they make this argument better by telling you that it's generational hatred. But secondly, we think this is hatred that Modi capitalizes on because referring to the OG claim that is like basically, ah, uh, like you don't have to have good relationships with someone. Like people in the US aren't looked at, looked at as like Xi Jinping lovers because the US trades with China. We don't think the people with the US are like actually reacting that way. We're actually going to take this a step further, right? And tell you our analysis on why he's actually going to capitalize on this hatred in the most. Because note that his whole platform is world domination in this way. The way that you do that is entering such an agreement and shouting to your supporters, look at how shitty China is now. This is independent of the actual economic trade arguments that you get. Because that's what their argument is hinged on. That China is going to win. Our argument is hinged on the kind of propagandizing populist kind of rhetoric that the BJP relies on to get its voting base most of the time. We also give you the structural reasons for why China is unlikely to actually win this for all of the reasons why like, India is most limited and specializing, which is why that economic argument trades on. But let's finalize this speech with our biggest contribution to this round. We fill in the gap that OG misses because we've all agreed at this point that the BJP existing and continuing to exist support is based on voters, which is why the poor voters actually care in the first place, not just it's better economic policy, but why vote BJP? The tipping point may not be that far 
farmer's magic makes the poor BJP, but that they ride into less and the damaging voices are sustained and you have a better platform policy. So, so proud to propose. Propose. I don't know what's going on. Propose. We'd like to see your philosophical remarks and we'd like to know some of the other things that we're doing. Our analysis 
analysis is relying on whether the voters blame the BJP for the factory closures. Our analysis about how the factory closures harm the people who own the fucking factories, which is oftentimes members of the BJP. Great, let's talk OG. Anyone wants to say I think OG destroyed their whole case. A few miscellaneous comments. First, they say that India is going to be emerging out of the middle income and we need to do more exports and new partners and whatnot. I think my show is way better than Top Hat. Why'd they get the timeline wrong here? We need to keep gro growing our domestic industries and then maybe later it would be economically beneficial to go global. OG says that other countries have a head start. We structurally prove this with at least four reasons. I thought they were pretty good. Next, OG says that BJP needs re-election and for this they need economic growth. Here's the problem. I'm unclear how much economic growth they need. Note that India has been growing for a really long time, for decades, 10% per year in terms of GDP growth. And so and the reason why they're probably going to continue doing this is because of their massive population. They have consumption-led economic growth, which is by far the most reliable form of economic growth on Earth. And so is it true, like, 15% economic growth versus 10% economic growth, does this really fucking matter for the BJP's re-election? I have absolutely no clue. Lastly, OG says that India is going to get concessions that are sort of from the RCMP. But honestly, no, I explain, I think better than our top half. Why does you get more concessions when you engage in these unilateral deals? Because you have more leverage over any given country. You have leverage over a pre-existing uh, trade structure, which has pre-existing rules, which you're probably not going to be able to change in the first place. Rules that are far more reflective of Chinese interests and Chinese preferences. Top half. If Modi can control information, why can't they just log the information of China and the trade deal to the average Indian farmer who probably doesn't watch that video? Yeah, so I think the fact that Modi can control information kind of hits like every single team. Because if Modi has control over information, he can say the economy is going great, but it doesn't really matter if the economy is going great. I think our impacts on like the pocketbooks is the one impact that's clearly independent of Modi's informational capacity. Great, let's talk about us. Or, yes, all right, a few responses to our case. First, there's supposedly attention. No, there's not at all. There's some cases in which trade between countries is going to be mutually beneficial, and there's other cases where it won't be. In the RCMP, you get way more of the cases where trade is not beneficial for India. Because having an awesome consumer market, which we characterize India has, is not the same as Indian industries being able to outcompete foreigners. These are two entirely separate economic capacities that a country may or may not have. So note, like, a key delta here is going to be, let's imagine there's a foreign country that makes a product really, really well, would love to send it, sell it to the 1.5 billion Indians, but India just literally doesn't make this product at all. At that point, India can say, hey, you really, really want access to our consumer market, so make an advantageous trade deal so that we can ship our cars to you at extraordinarily positive rates, but we benefit, you benefit, huzzah. Great. Next, they say there's sort of, a, in response to our case, there's an all-time high trade between India and China, but again, it's about whether you're actively joining the group. I know Owen has already said this, but they never explained again, as I said before, how the backlash works and why it's so big. Lastly, they say, well, why is protectionism the alternative? Not only is it because it's in the personal interest of the people who we characterize as doing the protectionism, but also because, uh, broadly speaking, like, it's in the interest of the Indian economy for reasons that we explained. They say Modi wants to conquer the globe, but know that the RCP rules are probably set in ways that are pro-China, India won't be able to conquer the globe if it goes through that way. Great, let's talk CG quickly. First, they say negotiations are bad on our side because you have unique needs and slow negotiations. This is far worse for the RCP for the reasons we showed. Next, they say rhetoric. Modi is neglecting farmers in the status quo. We explained why the RCP would fuck over farmers. I think Owen was already sufficiently prepared for this. They say, help rice exports somehow, but they never actually explain why you can't find sellers inside India. They have 1.5 billion mouths in India. Why the fuck do we need to export our rice? I don't know. Maybe that's intuitive to you. It's not to the average reasonable voter. Lastly, they say that Modi can say that we're getting more, uh, you're gaining more exports than China, and that this is proof that you should be elected. One, you can do this on both sides if all of our analysis on trade is right. Two, this is fucking nerd shit. The Modi's not going to pull up the graph during his rally. That's not the basis upon which Modi runs his re-election. Also, he can just lie, as Paul was pointed out in the POI, about whether or not the economy is growing in a particular way. You can always manipulate information in a way that is advantageous to your own position and to whatever your economic vision is. At the end of the day, I think we do quite a few important gap fills. Probably the two, hopefully the one. Cheers. <laughs>